OBS up, which means I now know we are live. Welcome back, everybody, Woo-hoo! to the Storytime Network. Uh, it is the Paradox Hour podcast, and today we are here with the evilest of intentions, because we are talking about villains. <laughs> We should specify, we are talking about villains. We are not talking about antagonists. They are... Yeah. They are... It's, it's kind of like the a pi- circle over. Yeah. The, it's the, a Venn diagram. The Venn diagram is, like, really close together, but not quite a circle. Mm-hmm. Um, so, because, you know, antagonists are, by their definition, just a character who is against the protagonist, which sometimes, you know, the antagonist has a really good reason for it, um, and is not actually that villainous. Sometimes the protagonist is the villain. Yep. Um, If you want to talk about villain protagonists, probably the quintessential examples are Walter White and uh, Light Yagami, but... Light was the one I was going to bring up in my of... in my examples. Um, the example what? of the f- was uh, Light was going to be the one that I brought up for the example of a villain protagonist. Um, in terms of a an example of a character who is an antagonist but not quite a villain. Um, I mean, my go to from yeah, uh, my go to is still always uh, Katakuri in One Piece. Mm-hmm. He's a good one. He's not a uh, villain. Course, he's, a, uh, he's a decent dude, but you know he's against yeah. Luffy, so he's an, he is an antagonist. And of course, there's also the examples of whenever the uh, protagonist is an outlaw. Half of the time, uh, the antagonist is going to be some noble inspector type. Yeah. They got your um, Zenigata. Zenigata, yeah. I mean, Lupin is a really good one because obviously, you know, Lupin is a scoundrel. Um... So he's lot. not a villain, though. He's an anti-hero. No, he is not a villain, and we're we're gonna have to make these distinctions as well. There are, you know, obviously a lot of distinctions in because villain villains is such a broad term. Um, yeah. So we're gonna have to make these distinctions, but you know, Lupin is a good choice. Uh, Zenigata, antagonist but not villain, um, from Part Six, Sherlock Holmes, antagonist, not a villain. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm treading on the wire of my headphone, which is not good. I need to keep bumbling up in my lap. No ideal. Um. So yeah. Um. Just quickly want to do that. Okay. Um. So we should pro- probably discuss some of the all-time great villains to kind of get a a benchmark. Yeah. <clears throat> so. One that you will see up brought a lot. Uh, you'll see a lot of supervillains come up, of course. The Joker, Lex Luthor, Green Goblin, all those ones. Very famous ones for being spectacular villains in most of their portrayals. Uh, there's also, of course, the Disney villains from the Renaissance movies. You got uh, such as Ursula, Captain Hook, uh, Jafar, Scar, all those. Absolutely fantastic and uh, villains, a lot of panache, you know. Mm-hmm. That's what really defines most of the Disney Renaissance villains: a lot of flair, you know. Well, a lot of them were, or a fair few of them were qu- uh, queer coded, weren't they? Not several, yes. Not all of them, though. Not all of them, but several of them, and certainly if they're male villains, that. <laughs> You know, does tend to uh, uh, embody some flamboyance, mm-hmm. if not a significant amount of flamboyance. Uh huh. And not to mention, you know, um, bombastic villains are fun for kids to um, to watch. Mm hmm. Yeah, let's see. Other greats. I, I mean, you got uh, I was, classics like Sauron. Sauron and Melkor. Mm-hmm. You go ahead and uh, crack off a few examples. 
plans. I mean, obviously, the one that always that comes first to mind for me is Joker. Yeah, the Joker is kind of hard to pop as a villain in yeah. a lot of cases, especially um, when he's written well. Obviously, that is the that is the caveat here. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes you have a bad Joker, and there is nothing that can save a, a bad Joker. It, I mean, or rather, a poorly written Joker. Yeah. I mean, this this could be an interesting uh, jumping off point. Thanos. Thanos, yes. The thing with Thanos is that he's very well performed, and he, at mm. certain points, he is very well written. There is a bit of dissonance uh, every now and then. Yeah. To what makes him function properly? Like, um. He works great as both like. Is very um, enthusiastic, hard carrying uh, villain, and also as this complex and deeply nuanced uh, antagonist. Hmm. But the the issue is like those uh, he's both those at the same time. That isn't always consistent for characterization. Hmm. And the other issue is, you know, it's the same with um, TV shows. Is that he's not always written by the same person. Hmm. That's the issue with a lot of TV shows. TV shows and comic books, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it is an issue because different people have different interpretations on characters and therefore will add in their own, you know, beliefs to those characters. Yeah. Like, when you have a consistent run on a comic book, that's one thing. Like, mm. you get a run of, like, several issues uh, with uh, Bane as the main antagonist and they're all written by the same people. Oh, he's going to be written very consistently. Mm -hmm. And then you switch to a different writer and Bane is suddenly a very different person. It's like, yeah. what the hell happens? And that's just one example. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's it can be just as, something as simple as, you know, um one writer finding a villain's um villain's motivations sympathetic and another doesn't. So one will write write the villain with Still doing those actions and still performing evilly, but you know, with an air of um, possibly tragic villainy, um, mm -hmm. or you know, your what you're trying to achieve is right. It's your methods that are wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other writer, so you get like sticking with Batman villains. You mm -hmm. get uh, examples like Poison Ivy and uh, Mister Freeze. Yeah, who are in most cases, portrayed sympathetically, mm. at least recently, over the past couple decades, they were a lot less sympathetic when they were first introduced. Yeah, and you know, you is... you will get those villains that you know were created decades ago when you know um, things were different, and you know, mm -hmm. you try and write them nowadays, and you go really can't make them a villain now can we really can't mm -hmm. make them a villain i mean in mr freeze's case what made him much more complex than he used to be was an episode of batman the animated series that basically uh overhauled his whole character into a much more tragic uh individual mm. and uh like very few writers have tried to break him from that mold, and every every attempt to do a different take on him besides that has been very poorly received. Did that episode introduce his wife? Yes. It's Heart of Ice, if I recall correctly. Mm. Um, One of the most famous episodes of that series. Mm. And then, of course, we've got some villains that aren't specific characters. They are, you know... Um specific races i guess um oh yeah that's fun you know the daleks in doctor who mm -hmm. um you know i mean you know there's there's more than a few um particular races in doctor who that you know are pretty much just villainous i mean again depictions vary um, I mean, for example, the uh, the Sontarans. Um, 
they were in a two part episode, a two parter episode uh, or story for um, David Tennant. Um, they were the villains. Um, and mm-hmm. then we got introduced during the 11th Doctor's run, uh, during Matt Smith's run, um, to Strax, who is a fan favorite character because he's fucking hilarious. <laughs> mm. Oh, Strax. That poor I, dumbass potato. There, of course, it, it also happens in uh, fantasy as well. Mm. You got your uh, classic or- or Tolkien orcs. <laughs> Who are probably the codifying example, but they're mm. not the um, only example. I'm pretty sure there are instances uh, from like mythology, mm. well before Tolkien, that did that. Mm. I'm trying to think. Maybe the mm, no, that's not right. Minotaurs. Oh no, the fire giants from Norse mythology. I think are like one of the original examples. Yeah, fire giants probably uh, probably count. Yeah. Um... Yeah, a lot of the there are very few villains in um, in mythology that you know aren't you know just outright villainous creatures that will always be always be villainous sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's you know that's because um, mythology is a uh, as a medium. Um, tends to be more simplistic because it's got to, you know, make its way through, um, through, you know, uh, decades, hundreds, thousands, years, however long it, you know, it lasts. Um, and, you know, you try and add nuance into there and the same thing will happen with, uh, as with, you know, comic books and TV shows. Some person will hear the story, think, huh, they seem you know, pretty sympathetic, actually, now that you mention it, and they'll tell a different version. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, you know, so mythology, mythology fairy tales also tend to be, you know, more simplistic with uh, more, um, well, with less nuanced villains. Yep. Because, again, you know, they are... They're meant for a certain purpose, which is to tell a tale with a uh, with a moral, basically. And honestly, villains don't have to be nuanced to be entertaining. No, they absolutely don't. I mean, you know, let's be real. Joker isn't really nuanced. He's just an evil dick when mm-hmm. it comes down to it. And he's still entertaining as fuck. Um... Trying to think of uh, another example. I mean, you know, fucking Sauron. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, he's not. Sar- he's not entertaining in the sense of you know he gets a lot of screen time and control controls the atmosphere, but you know, he is a good villain in that he seems all powerful, and we we want the heroes to beat that beat him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is the archetypal evil overlord. And for good reason. Mm-hmm. You know, that is... Um, that's... that's That, more than anything else, is what you want from a villain. It doesn't matter how much nuance you insert into them. If you... If the audience doesn't want to root for the hero to beat them, they are not a good villain. Or you've not written a good protagonist. One yes. of the two. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's both. If you're really yeah. bad. <laughs> if you're if you're really bad, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, villainous archetypes. To be fair, about mm. when we when we talk about what makes a good villain, honestly, it's the right. It's choosing the types of character traits and contrast with a. Uh, the protagonist and the narrative you're going for. Mm. You want a villain who uh, who bounces off the per- the uh, hero or the protagonist really well, and you want them to reflect uh, the themes of your story as best as you can as well. Mm. Those, I think, are the two biggest requirements for making a good villain. 
Now, there are other things that can enhance that for sure. Mm. A good performance and or good writing will bring the best out of that. Uh, that's why you get like incredibly, incredibly flamboyant villains who are just so incredibly fun to watch. Mm. Without like being super uh, deep. Or anything. I mean, you know, again, going back to the Joker, because uh, he does have some really good examples of this. There is a reason people still talk about Heath Ledger's Joker. Yeah, exactly. Because every time he was on the screen, he took control. Yeah, no, he dominated the screen whenever he was on it. Because he had that presence to yeah. him. Um, and, you know, sticking with the Joker, but... Um, Mark Hamill. Mark There's Hamill. No one. Mark Hamill, exactly. You know, you you really get a sense of what that what Joker is about when Mark Hamill voices him. And that's not to say other people haven't done just, just haven't done just as good a job voicing Joker. I mean, in um the Harley <laughs> Quinn series, Alan Tudyk is fantastic as Joker. Mm-hmm. Um doing, you know, a similar I'm actually having but a not... hard time thinking of a joke performance I don't like besides Jared Leto. Jared Leto, you know, admittedly, Jared Leto. <laughs> admittedly, we're a little biased in that Jared Leto is kind of a dick. Not even kind of, yeah. is a dick. Is a complete yeah. dick. Um, no, um, what kind of makes Jared Leto not work where the other examples do Jared Leto's Joker is overacted mm. and not in a way that really gels with the, the well, with what the character is and mm. what the narrative is. Like, he's supposed to be this gangster type version of Joker because mm. every cinematic version of the Joker has been a different archetype. Yeah. We've, we've had um, uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker was very much a mafioso. Uh, Keith Ledger's Joker was very much a psychopath, a psychopathic anarchist, uh, whereas um, uh, Jared Leto was apparently going for a psychotic uh, or a psychopathic uh, gangster. And it didn't really work very well mm. because his performance was just too over the top without providing any, like, I don't want to say nuance or substance. I mean, what, what what made Heath Ledger's Joker so good is there would be those moments of, of calm and, you'd, and, you know, in the movie even, they go, why, why should we be afraid of this man? You know, he's just a regular guy. And then he'll slam somebody's face into a pencil with, you know, yeah, there, sudden there violence. There is unpredictability to him. Yeah. Uh, you know, just in the opening scene of the movie, you you know what Joker is about because you know he perpetrates a bank robbery and then shoots his fucking helpers, if I recall correctly. Oh yeah, no, he he just engineers backstabbing amongst them and kills off the last one. Yeah, like and in in that in that one scene, you know exactly what this Joker is is about. Mm-hmm. But I also think, you know, um, it also, you know, depends on um, the the character across from, from him. Because, you know, Jared Leto's Joker could have maybe worked if, um, you know... If he was in a scene with, you know, Batman. Not even if he was in a scene with Batman. If he was in a scene with, you know, the Adam West Batman. The goofy Batman. You know, somebody who could, you know, take Jared Leto's overacting and then turn it up to a hundred themselves. Um, but, but he was know. up with one who, uh, he was up with people who were not, um, well, it's, which weren't vibing with him. Which movies did Jared Leto actually play the Joker in? I believe it was uh, Suicide Squad, the first one, and Justice League. So, yeah. You know, 
both of those movies were fucking uber dark because they were, you know, fucking um, what's his face, uh, Zack Schneider's idea. Well, Zack Schneider only did Justice League. Uh, David Ayer was the one who did Suicide Squad. But it was a similar. Yeah, that one didn't it was turn out a, well either. It was a similar vibe. It it was serious. It was serious superheroes. Mm -hmm. and serious villains and therefore you know some dickhead uh chewing the scenery is is not gonna fit the suicide squad the first suicide squad movie just had so many problems with tone yeah um i, I could go on all day about it but let's not again you know heath ledger's joker works because he is a serious portrayal of the character against a very, very serious portrayal of Batman. Christian, Christian Heath Ledger's Joker isn't afraid to crack jokes. It's just like when I say he's so, mostly portrayed straight. Yeah, like straight. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying he doesn't have his moments of humor, but because that would that would be against type for the character. That the character is that he is a jester, and they are. They routinely, you know, crack jokes. But the point is, you know, he, um, you know, he built his performance around the tone of of Batman and that those particular movies, which were, you know, serious takes on Batman. Um, you know, uh, Alan Tudyk manages to, uh, you know, gets to act incredibly, you know, over the top. Because Harley Quinn is a comedy. Yep. And because it has serious moments, but it is mostly comedic. Yeah, and because the joke joke with Batman there is that he is the one serious guy in a world of fucking lunatics. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Like the point that that's the point. They are they are playing playing Batman straight for comedy, and is and that's what makes him so funny in that instance. But obviously, because it's comedy, that means that you know, Joker gets to say something like when uh, at the end of season one, when he you know finds out that uh, Bruce Wayne is Batman, is gets to go. I put a deposit down for an electric car from Wayne Enterprises. Where's my goddamn electric car, Bruce? <laughs> that's the type of dialogue that would not fit in, say, um, Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. It just nope. wouldn't. It would be stupid. It, it's, it would be out of character for that portrayal of Joker. But for the one in Harley Quinn, it works. <laughs> and that is one of the big things. The issue of tone. Mm. Like, you have to have a villain who matches the tone of what you're going for. Unless you're going for some really strong whiplash. Yeah. Like, if the villain is meant to make everything darker the moment they arrive, that's one thing. But if you have, like, an absolutely ham-tastical actor, or just absolutely devouring scenery left and right, you don't try to fit them into a very uh, serious examination of uh, criminality or anything like that. Yeah. Because it does not jive. Like, if you were to put Anton Sugar in, like, a fucking Disney movie, it would not work very well, because Anton Sugar is fucking terrifying, and most Disney movies are not really made to support villains like him. I wonder if that's part of the reason, um, like, a lot of the, certainly the second two, um, Iron Man villains didn't really work. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Because I mean, Iron Man is such a such a joke cracking uh, character that it just feels odd. You know, it just it just doesn't feel right when the villain across from him is some fucking uh, stoic dude, you know, with a persecution complex. Yeah, Justin Hammer works a lot better than uh, Ivan Vonko, I think. Oh, absolutely. Because basically like. Yeah, Hammer is basically like a super incompetent, uh, egotistical Tony Stark. He bounces really well off of Tony. Mm -hmm. Bonko just doesn't have personality. Yeah, it, it, it would have fit better if, you know, Hammer was the true villain and Vanko was the dragon. Because then you, at least you've got, you know, you've got Hammer taking control of the social scenes, but you can still let Vanko be the actual fighter. Mm-hmm. No. 
Hammer is just a, a pawn for Ivanko. Yeah. Um, who's the villain in fucking three again? Killian. Killian. He was just such a nothing character. Yeah, like, no, he's just like this token resentful scientist dude. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest, um, Mysterio worked a lot better in that archetype. Because mm -hmm. again, he was up against Spider-Man. So, Jake Gyllenhaal, I've, I believe that's who played him. Um, yep, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, was able to be pretty fucking hammy in his role. Because obviously, yeah. and, that's, and that's what was expected of his character in that movie as well. But he was able to do that because he was across from Spider-Man, who is a fucking snarky, <coughs> snarky teenage dickhead. <laughs> You know, even uh, even if in that movie, you know, Peter Parker is depressed because of losing uh, his father, the father figure, and is struggling with the weight of pressure. You know, he still manages to get fucking quips in because that's what mm -hmm. Spider Man is. Um, but you know, Killian didn't have that personality. <laughs> no, he didn't. Um, now, and to be fair, now, they don't that's... have to have like super big personalities. No. They can also be stoic badasses, like, and they can work really well. Darth Vader works really well in the Star Wars trilogy because he is, or the, the original trilogy, hmm. because he is this absolutely menacing figure that is basically unstoppable. And every time he shows up, uh, it's like the heroes have no choice but to run. Up until Luke actually gets trained well enough to hold his own. Well, you know that's that's a that's a that that is as you said the villain archetype of uh, you know um, unstoppable force, and that is yeah. that is a completely valid archetype to use. Um, you know, and that means it is all about you know making sure the hero's journey goes well, and you give you know. Um, a good reason for why um, the hero can then beat the villain. Now, in uh, in um, A New Hope, you know, it was justified in that, you know, Luke is a good pilot already, and uh, then, um, you know, awakens to his force powers properly. I think I've, mm -hmm. I'm I'm making a guess on my limited knowledge of the of the original trilogy because I haven't I've watched them yeah, but Luke not... doesn't directly confront Vader in the yeah. in the first movie he don't because he he'd get him fucking in, uh, he'd get in, KO'd in... instantly oh yeah no even after some training when he confronts Vader in Empire he gets absolutely fucking bodied yeah I mean the the point of the point of the um, final fight in um, Return of the Jedi? Return of the Jedi, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, is that Luke isn't outright trying to fight either Vader or um, Sidious. The Emperor, yeah. Um, you know, because he knows he's going to lose. He's this fucking kid from uh, the boonies who's had, you know, as much training uh, from Yoda as the little puppet's body could handle. And it was, you know, he knew it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Um. So, you know, he works to, you know, basically use his knowledge, use his wits, and separate the two of them. And it works because Vader is that tragic villain figure. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, that's good characterization work. Um, in the original trilogy, you know, because yeah, because in the first movie, obviously Vader is this unstoppable force. But as the trilogy goes on, you learn more and more about Vader. Um, you know, almost culminating in, um, you know, that reveal at the end of Strike Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. Um. Who else do we want to cover? Do we want to cover somebody from anime? Yeah, sure. Um, let's talk about some of the greats from anime. Mm. Uh, 
Crocodile and Doflamingo for one piece immediately spring to mind. Uh, Light Yagami for, from Death Note, um, at least in the first half of Death Note, before it all went shit. Um, uh, Griffith from Berserk. Oh, Griffith. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dio um, Brando. Dio. Uh, and Yoshikage Kira. Um, from JoJo. Yep. Um, King Piccolo, Frieza, um, even Cell from, from Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Ragyo Kiryu and uh, no, she's not as good a villain as uh, her sidekicks, as her minions. I I feel like uh, Satsuki and uh, Nui are better villains than uh, Ragyo mm. because they do have a lot more. Uh, they're a lot less generically evil. Mm -hmm. Um. Who else from the world of Shonen Jump? Let me just have a look at the series. Um, I mean, we're we're trying to think of uh, good examples, obviously. Um, for the time being, but there Orochi are Maru from Naruto, well, at least the first half. Yeah. <laughs> Before it went to shit, yes. <laughs> I mean the issue um, the issue with the Roshimaru in the first half of Naruto is that I don't know, I suppose he does turn up in, in, on a couple of occasions, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Um I mean yeah, the the issue is is that, you know, the characterization in Shippuden just went to shit. You know, you had Correct. you had a really interesting villain in, you know, Itachi that went to shit when suddenly he became a fucking hero. <laughs> yeah, suddenly he's actually a good dude now. Um, you know, honestly, Sasuke had the potential to be a pr actually a really good villain uh, facing off against Naruto, and then he fucking ruined it by flip-flopping all the time. <laughs> yep. Um... Uh, who else? I mean, I can't, you know, I can't justifiably include, um, really include any of the, um, any characters from, say, sports manga, because they're not villains, they're antagonists, they're not villains. Yeah. I mean, you do have, like, Aizen from Bleach, who is well-known, at least, and well-regarded for the most part. For the most part. Even his plan is whack as fuck. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. What about Hero Aka? Do you think any of the villains? All for one. All for one, yeah. Hero Aka is in a unfortunately weird position of... The focus very much changed. And I was actually thinking about this earlier today. Um, because somebody did bring up uh, Hero Aka and villains. Hero Aka sort of changed focus midway through. And that mm -hmm. almost, I honestly think it kind of hurt it, because um, in the first, the first, I would say half, uh, basically up to over, up to the end of overhaul, um, it was a pretty black and white narrative of heroes versus villains. You had the, you know, you had a character like Stain, um, who did rail against Hero Society, but he never mentioned anything really specific. The people, or anyone mm. really specific, the people that we know he went after, like, there wasn't... We didn't see that justification. We, all we know is that he went after... Um, the two, only two named ones we know he went after were um, Ingenium the first and... Um, Native, Native, I think. And we don't get... Obviously, you know, we... We know of Ingenium through... Um, through tenure, Rita. um, yeah. and those of us who've read Vigilantes and know of him from there, and I'm gonna be real, from what I saw of him there, there's no reason for a Stain to have gone after him. Yeah, Stain was written a bit weird, and we obviously know nothing about, um, we know almost nothing about Native. And the third thing is that you know, again, he's a character where the ends don't justify the means. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
it's all well and good him saying that these heroes are corrupt, but he's killing them. <laughs> You know, it it doesn't it doesn't sit right. So you know, although we've got a character like Stain who does you know take target at the uh, Hero Society, very few of them actually have any real nuance to them. But once we get past Overhaul and once we hit the school festival, the view starts to become more about the corruption of Hero Society, starting with Gentle, Gentle mm -hmm. Criminal, who is not a villain. Let's get that out of the way now. He's not a villain. He's an antagonist. He is not a villain. I mean, you could argue that he's an anti-villain, but that's semantics at that point. At the very, at the worst, he is um, a tragic villain. But at the end of yes. the day, he's the worst he was really doing was robbing stores. I think. Mm -hmm. Like in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. I mean, I think I think when yeah. he when he went down, it was more because of uh, quirk use than it was anything else. Yep. But after that point, you know, we get we get my villain academia, which characterizes and fleshes out um, the League of Villains a lot more, and makes them, in the eyes of a lot of um, the a lot of the fandom, um, makes them more a lot more sympathetic. A lot more yeah. interesting, but almost less villainous. Yeah, I mean, it does. They don't have to be more evil to be more interesting. Is the thing? No, and I'm not saying I'm not isn't saying that. Pure evil. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But my but my point is is that that then blurs the line between you know the heroes we've been following and the villains that suddenly we find. Huh? You know, the likes of Darby and Toga and Twice. That you know, twice is twice is a decent dude who just wants friends. Twice just really has shit luck. You know, uh, Toga. I don't like her because she's a yandere, but there's a significant proportion of the fandom that see her as this really tragic figure. Darby, you know. Going into Darby would be a lot of spoilers. Yeah. Spoiler warning is up, and I do want to sort of... It's sort of important to talk about him. Okay, so just spoiler alert Spoiler, Spoiler, spoiler alert for um, the My Hero manga. Uh, um, it will be covered in the most recent... Uh, in the, in upcoming, the upcoming season of upcoming the anime. Season yeah. of the anime. Um, but if you are anime only, turn off now. I'm not going to be that fucking prick who's like, oh, if anime onlys don't want to be spoiled, they should just read the manga. Because fuck that guy. Fuck that guy and the horse he rode in on. I'm not going to be that. Anime onlys, mute now. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously Darby is, as the fandom theorized for so many years, Darby is Todoroki Toya. Which obviously... <laughs> It becomes this big thing of, well, we sympathized with Shoto. Do we then sympathize with Darby slash Toya? Uh, the difference between the two is that well, I... both were victims of truly awful abuse at the hands of their father. Yes, again. Darby then, they... Darby then went off the fucking deep end and murdered a bunch of people. His like his, his rage at Endeavor is one hundred percent justified, but his behavior is not exactly. And yet, you'll still get a uh, not insignificant portion of the fandom defending him. <laughs> there are there are two members of the League of Villains that are more likely to show up on the uh, hero side in fan fiction than any of the others. That is Darby, and that is Toga. I can understand Toga, because she is very mentally ill. And... To be fair... She could have reasonably converted with therapy, but... Yeah. To be fair, more often than not, what they'll do with Darby is they'll, you know... Uh, they'll have Izuku get to him... Izuku or Shoto get to him... Post stain, but pre, generally pre um, summer camp. Mm. 
Sometimes, sometimes it is after. Um, but basically, they'll do the whole thing of, um, oh, Dobby hasn't actually killed anyone yet. Or if he has, it's actually villains. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is some bullshit right there. <laughs> yeah, you know, they do the same. They do the same with Toga. They do the same with Toga. Yeah, they're both kind of serial killers. So <laughs> yeah. Um. So Look, twice is, in my opinion, the most sympathetic of the league. Has twice, twice actually hurt anybody? <laughs> I mean, he's beaten up a few people, but that's about it. Yeah, twice, twice no, he is... might have done, maybe during the uh, during the uh, war with the uh, Liberation Army. Yes, past obviously past that point, you know. Um, I very much doubt I'm going to be reading any fan fiction that gets to that point of the narrative and then goes, "Okay, let's start redeeming these people." I doubt yeah. we're gonna get to those points, um, but you know, yeah. it's, they even go, they even try it with Shigaraki. You know, um, I mean, I've you know uh, read one where um, read a series where uh, Hawks started to basically. Uh, turn all of the uh league of villains members to uh vigilanteism rather than straight villainy mm. um to be fair i think he was aided by zuku in that um in the sense of barely sure zuku gave some some hard truths to uh to shigaraki some conversations which made him more amenable um mm. But as uh, yeah, as a result, it becomes a lot messier, um, and a lot harder to you know. I mean, a lot harder to really truly support the the hero side. Obviously, you know, we want to support characters like Izuku Shadow for some Bakugo. But at the end of the day, you've uh... got somebody like Endeavor there. Really yeah. stinking up the fucking joint. My thing I, is, Endeavor's pretty damn well written for a Horikoshi. Horikoshi has done his fucking best. The issue is, it's come at it's come at the wrong time of the narrative. It's come yeah, at, it came also, at, it came after the tone shift, mm, and therefore it doesn't. Also, seem I do real. feel like he should have focused more on Tobacco Go than Endeavor. He probably should have. That's also not helping. <laughs> that is yeah, really uh, not helping, but yes. Um, back to villains. I, mean, I think we were pretty focused on villains. <laughs> we were yeah. talking about the My Hero villains, but yeah, we. I mean, all for one, you know, there is, n there is no redeeming quality there. Even if oh, the fandom will try. <laughs> He is an absolute monster. He is entertaining as fuck, and he carries his cards way out in the open yeah. because he embraces the villainy. I'll give you this one. He, he, I, it is, he is better in the anime than he is in the manga, in my opinion, and that is solely because of the performances. It's the voice acting and the music that definitely push him over the edge. The music helps. So let me... Uh... His theme is fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Do you remember who he is played by in the sub? I do not. I will have to look that up right now. I'm well, just... I'm I'm looking up his dub actor, so I'll I'll do it uh do it at the same time. Um, Akio Otsuka. Oh, of course it's Akio Otsuka. Oh, ah, that's that will be wonderful. Um, and he's John Swayze in the dub, and who also does an incredible job. Oh god, I I really want to hear Akio Otsuka as, as all for one now because I fucking love him. He does, no, he's fantastic. Just such good villain voices. Yep. Um. Oh, he voices fucking Thorkel. Oh my god, voices Thorkel. Um. Oh, speaking of Vinland Saga, Oscalod. So. Does Oscalot count as a villain? No. Absolutely what not. Is... 
because he's he is... half protagonist, half villain, half antagonist. And yes, I know I used three halves there. That's the point. The issue is he is set up to be a villain and then he becomes an antagonist and then he becomes the protagonist. He is just such a complex character. <laughs> and unfortunately, the it doesn't work. It, it, in my opinion, it didn't work. Obviously, we've got more to come for Vinland Saga. This was just the prologue, as uh, people have told me when I've complained about this before. But I don't think that transition from villain to antagonist to protagonist works. And obviously, you know, him being a pro protagonist does not make him not a villain. But the narrative becomes all about his goals... And they are sympathetic goals. It's kind of wild that you ha you wind up rooting for Askeladd more than you wind up rooting for Thorfinn at points. Exactly. And that's the issue. Like, um, say what you will about Askeladd. He is fantastically written. He's a really As interesting just... character. It's ju it is just the fact that, you know... We get six episodes... Of establishing that the goal of Thorfinn is to kill Askeladd. Thorfinn is the protagonist. That is the goal we root for. Mm -hmm. And then the next, was it 18 episodes? Yeah, something like that. Now, admittedly, you know, it steadily becomes apparent that no, Thorfinn should not be trying to get revenge. Um, you know, his goal should be to find Vinland and live a normal life. And I'm sure that is what his journey will continue to be in Season 2 and beyond if there's more of it. Um, but, you know, it's... I think Askeladd's character arc would have worked better had it been after Thorfinn made that realization. Mm. As it was, Askeladd, and spoiler warning for the end of Vinland Saga, season one, Askeladd dies having basically achieved his goals. Yep. And, you know... I mean, part of his goal was to die in the specific way that he did. Mm. And given, you know, it just it just sits wrong with me having, you know, had this image of Askeladd as a villain. Mm. Um, I mean, and that is kind of just a personal take on it. It is a personal take cause... on it. I will fully admit that. It is, is my personal take on Vinland Saga that, you know, I, as much as I enjoyed... Uh, a lot of parts of Vinland Saga, especially Thorkel. Um, Thorkel was a great. very fun character. Um, and again, not as much as he took the antagonist role for for part of the show, wouldn't say he was a villain. No. Um, but I just I just couldn't get past that feeling I had at the end of season one of. I don't like this. I don't feel good about any of this. Like, I... I don't know. Some will say that's the point. I shouldn't have, you know... Um, and it's, you know, it's the point of, of Thorfinn's... Of Thorfinn's arc. This is, this is his lowest point. And this mm -hmm. is... This is where he will start to hopefully rise up. I'm really hoping there are not more debts for him to jump to. Um, but, you know, I I watch stuff, I watch stuff, I read stuff, I listen to stuff, whatever, I play stuff to enjoy myself, and I don't like finishing something feeling sh like shit. <laughs> Completely fair. Um, you know, that is... That is where I think, you know, um, 
the Song of Ice and Fire books go wrong. I mean, Song of Ice and Fire does have fantastic villains, though. It does. They just win too often for me. <laughs> I mean, they win, but at the same time, they also lose quite spectacularly. There are some villains that are still winning somehow. Yeah, but that's because they're the, the premier schemers. Yeah. Um, you know, it, but even, you know, getting that catharsis is, is all well and good, but it doesn't help me when I'm going through, you know, the fucking 40th chapter of Sansa just being broken inside. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, what's great is seeing, uh, all of Tywin's actions catch up to him because Tywin is a monster, but he is mm. a fantastic villain, and serves again, to illustrate no. a lot of the themes of the series. Again, a character who is improved in the show by the basis of his actor, because Charles, Charles Dance, Dance fucking killed fantastic. him. He yeah. just has so... He just commands a room, and that is exactly how you think Tywin Lannister should be. Yeah, no. I would. I cannot think of another actor who I would rather have as Tywin Lannister than Charles Dance. He's just too damn good. Mads Mikkelsen might have been able to do it because he's got a similar. Mads presence. Mikkelsen is a bit too young at this point to he's play. He's probably Tywin. a bit too young. Yes, but I. St I think he probably could have done it. You're, you're not entirely wrong there. But Mads Mikkelsen again. I'll say Mads Mikkelsen would have been a good Euron Greyjoy. Yeah. I, I'll i give him this. I don't think the actor did a bad job. He I was think, just given an absolute... He was given, he was given some shit. Um, shit to do, but I think he did his best to portray... Portray Euron as he is. Which is, you know, a... A hammy psychopath... Well, in the books, he's a lot more sinister than he is in the show. Because mm. that's the thing. He has, like, a clear agenda in the books of apocalyptic proportions. I think he... No, Whereas in the, in, the show, in the show, he's glad to just dick around and uh, happy to plop his... Uh, yeah. Plop him, himself right at the, the foot of Cersei's, Cersei's throne. That, that does not work with book you're on. I think, um, I mean, we we are getting off topic, but I'll I'll finish with this. Um, I think that the something of the issue that um, the writers fell into is they couldn't write the dialogue, you know, the way um, it was in seasons one to four seasons one to five at a push mm -hmm. and so they started adding in more quips to fill that space because yeah, they, they just because they know they know people like quips based on you know that is that is what part of what people liked about the early seasons and that is you know what people like about um about the mcu in part but they don't like it being so overpowering in Game of Thrones. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't like it being overpowering in the MCU. As as has been I mean, seen from the, the uh, reaction to Thor Love and Thunder. Mm -hmm. um, but we should get back to villains. I mean, do we want to talk about... Um, some of the villains of um, A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, yeah, or, or just Game of Thrones. most of them are pretty good. I mean... At least um, the, the schemers. The schemers are the good ones. I mean, the issue with, the issue with certainly A Song of Ice and Fire, it's, it's more clear-cut in the show, I think, but in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's not always easy to tell who the villain is and and who the heroes are because it's very it's a very shades of gray world mm -hmm. um, the closest we have to heroes are the starks yeah and even then they they do either uh aid in or directly do some pretty shady shit yeah especially Ar aria and her murder spree murder children murder children 
that is actually the... murder children. Just endorse children committing murder, obviously. Yeah. No, that's 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 what I was meaning it with. It's sort of the issue of that rallying cry, which is also the rallying cry of uh, the elusive samurai fan base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. No, like the clear villains for A Song of Ice and Fire range widely in quality. Mm. Like we talked about it a bit in our tier list, but mm. um, Rams uh, Ramsey Bolton. Ramsey Bolton is a clear villain. Yeah. Ramsey Bolton's a clear villain, but he is all the worse for it because he is just such a he's a psychopath with very little nuance. Yeah, and therefore it makes it hard f to enjoy him sticking around for so fucking long. Yeah, the same could be said of uh, Greer Cle Clegane and uh, similar characters. Like but Greg, it's hard to enjoy the... those characters because yeah. they are just walking walking villainy devices the mountain uh is helped certainly in the show by actually being able to see his uh his abilities in action um mm -hmm. you know get to see him do something you know in his fight against uh Oberyn Martell you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to uh, really, you know, enjoy that fight in the box because it is it is written down. It is all about, you know, how well it's written and then you filling in the gaps. Whereas in the show, you get to see this fucking mount, mount, literal mountain of a man swinging a fucking, like, five-foot sword around. <laughs> yeah, he, he yeets around a big fuck-off sword and... Uh... Every time he gets close to Ober and you're worried he's gonna just chop the dude clean in half. Yeah. Um And we know it's possible because the fucking hound did it, and the mountain is stronger than the hound. Yep. Um So, you know, but in the books we don't have that, and because of generally um books are better for this well written media is better for this than um tv shows and movies and all that jazz but because of the how lengthy and how verbose and uh all that stuff gurm is in his writing it's hard to actually you know read be able to basically go okay this bit is Say Ramsey Bolton committing an atrocity. I can just skip this paragraph. Oh, he's still doing it in the next paragraph. Next paragraph. Turn the page. Still doing it. Still doing it. I'm just going to go to the next chapter. What chapter is this? Oh, God, the mountain is raping somebody. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. To be fair, at least all that stuff is kept off screen, or mm -hmm. at least most of it. I, yeah, I was just, I wasn't bringing up a specific instance or anything, but you know, you get my point. Yes. Because of, because of Gurum's writing style, it lingers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, it's again, we're getting off the point of, of villains a bit, um, but I find it the same in um, Stormlight Archives. It was, mm. it was hard getting through Kaladin's stuff because it took so long. Yeah. There was so much to say and do, and it was all depressing. <laughs> That's completely fair. The point where well, I am struggling to get up the nerve to reread it, but you know, that's topic for another day. I mean, is there any yeah. Stormlight Archive villains you want to particularly shout out? Or well, we chuck under the bus? Us. Uh, Sadius and the Teravangian are probably the two examples that stand out the most. Sadius was the dude who got uh, stabbed at the end of book two. Yes, book two. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't know how to stop being an asshole. Yep, and he gloated about it to Adeline in private with no witnesses. That was a really like bad a move ass. on his part. Yeah, that was a bad move on his <laughs> part. <laughs> To be fair, he he probably overestimated how honorable Adeline is. Son of Dalinar! 
Yeah, I mean, he's Dalinar's kid. Of course he would, uh, but he's honorable. I mean, Dalinar was, was, is honorable in the current day. He's He wasn't in the past. True. Um, and uh, Taravangian, um, has he gone to outright villainy stat status? I thought it was still yeah. iffy. I oh, he's a villain. I I can't remember is the issue. I've I've read them once, and it was probably a good three years ago. It was pre-pandemic. Oh, have you not read book four yet? I haven't read book four because I kept meaning to fucking reread the first three books so I could remember exactly what happened because they're long fucking books and a lot happens. <laughs> um. In, in book three, he uh, uh, either book two, no book two, he outright hires Zeth to kill uh, Dalinar. Fair enough. Can we honestly say Dalinar didn't have it coming? No, but at the same time, it would have been very bad if Dalinar actually died at that point. Yes, almost certainly, yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. Back to Song of Ice and Fire real quick. We didn't really mm. shout out the actual good villains in that one all mm. that much besides making mention of Tywin. But there, there's also Littlefinger and Varys as probably the most preeminent schemers in the series. Mm. To be fair, to be fair we... we dance in Shades of Grey a little bit, but Littlefinger is Lit outright Lit villainous. Littlefinger, I think we can outright say is villainous. He's in it for himself. Varys is a yeah. lot more of a complex figure because we don't know exactly... Um, what he's going for. Is he mm. just trying to preserve his power with the um, with a king that, you know... Because obviously, you know, we assume that Aegon, in inverted commas, assuming he is, you know, Aegon, whatever, um, will feel indebted to Varys for saving him. Mm -hmm. Is that the... Is that the goal for Varys, or is that just a neat little side effect? It's hard to say. Varys is a very hidden agenda type character. We don't get a lot of Varys in the books, is the issue. Yeah. Hey, he, I, he basically disappears he's a, from the books after Tyrion, halfway through book three. Yeah. He, much away into book three. He stays in the background a lot better than Littlefinger, <laughs> who loves a good monologue. Hey, to be fair, Littlefinger loves monologuing to his uh, bastard understudy. Yeah. Um, so we don't know, we don't exactly know whether Varys is doing this for himself or if he's actually doing it because he thinks that Aegon or Daenerys will be a good ruler for the realm. Obviously, you mm -hmm. know, I've seen some interpretations, I've seen other interpretations um, in the fan fiction that I read, the Ned Stark Lives one. Um, he was very much... Um, working for the little folk and trying to find mm -hmm. the best king for them or queen. Um, but, you know, it it varies. Again, it depends on whose interpretation you, you're talking to. I've seen interpretations of uh, Varys all the way across the moral spectrum. Yeah. It's what makes him so fascinating. It is. Um, and then you have outright villains who are also well-written, but very awful people like Bruce Bolden and Walter Frey. Like outright assholeish people who are very clear villains, but damn if they aren't very, very well written to what they're supposed to do. I mean Bruce Bolton has this creepy charisma to him that just mm -hmm. jumps off the page. Whereas Walter Frey is just such a slimy hate sink that you can yeah. practically feel the to shower every time he's on screen. Mm -hmm. Like they they both play their villainous roles really well. Yeah, they're good examples of how to write very a uh, variety of villain types mm. that work in conjunction with other villain types. Yeah, I feel like part of the reason that Daenerys' storyline is significantly weaker than a lot of the other storylines is that. Most of our antagonists are really generic. Yeah. They're basically just slavers. I mean, and good on her for roasting those fuckers, but... Yeah, obviously, no. We... You know, the issue is not that they are, you know, hateable enough. It's that they don't have any characterization. And, again, that can work, but 
at the end of the day it, it, in a in a work like a song of ice and fire that again is just so long that sort of villain doesn't really cut it especially when contrasted with the villains that the other major characters have to deal with yeah like john snow dealing with uh the internalized uh internalized bigotry of the watch and dealing with the conflicts with the wildlings mm. is a lot more compelling than just Dan Dan daenerys having to deal with oh here is slaver number 345 yeah Burnham. and you know there is another example of a not particularly characterized villain in uh in that universe the white walkers the knight's king but they work yeah because but because they are you know the un they are the, the they are the vader they are the unstoppable force they are the do not come across these fuckers you will die type villain yeah they are the imminent threat that no one knows how to fucking deal with I mean, and that's... they are an apocalypse coming exactly in that sense they're less of a villain and more of a natural disaster mm -hmm. you know we there is a way to stop this from happening but you have to get enough people on side to do it. And, and there's we are way too much scrolling because of all those aforementioned human villains. And we are rapidly approaching the point where... Um, the point of no return, basically. Mm -hmm. But moving on to another, also... another book series. Uh, unless you had something else to say about uh, Song of Ice and Fire. I actually do want to bring up a book series that I know you'll probably hate me for bringing up, but it is a valid thing to bring up. Harry Potter. Yeah. Like, I will give J.K. Rowling credit for this one thing. Umbridge is a fantastic villain because of how loathsome she is in such a believable and real way. Mm. I'm glad you didn't mention like, Voldemort, because I had a bone to pick. I have a bone to pick there. No. Umbridge. Umbridge, is, yes. Umbridge works because she yeah. is she is a hate sink. She's a very well-written and realistic And she sink. doesn't overstay her welcome, is the other point. Yes. Voldemort's basically in all of the books, but Umbridge, she only takes the, spotlight one and a half. The issue with Voldemort is he's just not fucking around. Well, he is fucking around by not being around. Yeah, he's never he's never around. We see him at the end of books. And that's it. Um, and again, he's meant to be... The best I can say about him is he's meant to be, again, this unstoppable force, this Darth Vader. But it's not satisfying the way Harry beats him. Nope. Because it's, cause it doesn't... Because it's a deus ex machina that's introduced in the final book. Also, it's just like very anticlimactic overall because it's very just like anticlimactic. A, they, and they also, trade blows, then Voldemort dies. Yeah, and also this fucking prophecy they've been hyping up since book fucking one had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, Voldy grabbed the wrong wand. It's not his anymore. So yeah. uh, poof, hi, there you go. Yeah. So I so I don't think Voldemort is a good villain. Tell you who I think no. is a good unintentional villain. Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. Because he manipulates everyone into dancing like his little puppets, and he comes out on fucking top. He will Speaking always of... be remembered well. Mm-hmm. Speaking of characters like Voldemort, uh, or not Voldemort, characters like Dumbledore, we have uh, one guy, Sextus. Guys. Who has to deal with quite a few ones of his own. Yeah, we can talk about Codex Alara's villains. I would, if you're trying to say Sextus is a villain, I would disagree. No, no, I was Good. just using that as a transition. Okay, okay, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. Because, you know, the point of Sextus is that he is so well written, he's not a villain. He's very much, well, we could, we've talked about Sextus quite a bit. If you, if you want to hear us talk about Sextus, uh, check out our very first, uh, very first three streams. We talked about Codex Lara there, um, in more mm -hmm. detail. But in terms of, um, 
Codex of Valor of Villains. Obviously, we've got the Vord. And the Vord Queen. Vord are much the classic Apocalypse Horde. Very much so. Um, but the Vord Queen gets some really good characterization. Again, <laughs> I... I don't know why I compare Codex Alara to Harry Potter so much, but the Vord Queen is the is Voldemort done well. The Vord Queen doesn't appear that much until the final book. And then we get a bunch of characterization for her that works to the point where when Tavi finally does kill her, we actually feel kind of sorry for her. Mm-hmm. We are glad she's gone. We are glad she's gone. And we are cheering that Tavi managed to do it. But we do feel sad That's... for her. Mm -hmm. Because she is a she is a slave to her nature more than anything else. Speaking of slavery, uh, we also have... The... And Kalar. Kalare. The Kalarans. Yep. Or the two Kalares. See, Kord is an example of how I would say not to write a villain. Because he is basically just, like, very generic and one-dimensional. <laughs> He's like a hate sick done wrong. It's sort of the issue of the first book, is it is very black and white. Mm -hmm. There is no real nuance there. Um, and that extends to Cord. And yes... We just those scenes where uh, Isana and um, Odiana are mm -hmm. taken prisoner by Cord are incredibly uncomfortable to read, to the point where when I did my reread a couple of months ago, you I skipped them. Those chapters, didn't you? Yep. I read them before. I know what happens. I don't need to read them again. Mm -hmm. Um. I think it's a. I think it was necessary for the character journey Asana went on. Um, it was still uncomfortable as fuck. But yes, it was very uncomfortable to read. Um, I don't think he's not a well-written villain in the sense that no. you know he's not got any nuance to him. But I think he is a good villain in the sense that you really, really want him to fucking die. Yes. That you is want fair. him to go the fuck down. And you want Isana to be the one doing it. Because at the end of the day, he is a fucking sla misogynistic slaver. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure if we can necessarily call him racist. Um he probably is. I would not be surprised. Racism is kind of the fault in the world. I there's not much race. There's, xenophobia, maybe. Yeah. There's racism against, like, other technically species. Racism, I guess? Yeah. Okay. There's not really... There's not anything I would say... Like, there's nobody, like... Uh, we don't meet somebody from um, Antillus who, like, is racist to somebody from Parsha, for example. Mm. Like, no, we don't... but we do come from Antillus who's racist against the Icemen. Um, again, that plays into the, you know, speciesism, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what I, uh -huh. what you would call it. Um, but antag or villain that was done very well, NVIDIA Aquitaine. Oh, NVIDIA. Again, big old fucking hate sink. Big old fucking hate sink. Honestly, she kind of borders on Magnificent Bastardry. Yeah. I would say up until a point, up until she gets shot in book four, she does manage to be. As you know, she has she has that moment in um, First Lord's Fury where she manages to uh, skewer um, Attis, mm -hmm. which is pretty magnificent bastard standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she. I think she treads the borderline between magnificent bastard and petty asshole pretty damn well. She does. She so does. She does lean towards the latter a bit more than the former sometimes. But again, she's she is another one who is a slave to her nature. She can mm -hmm. she physically cannot help being a backstabbing asshole. To the yep, point to that, the point where the Vord the point. to the point where the Vord Queen is like, 
I'm just planning for it now. <laughs> I'm just planning around <laughs> your backstabbing nature, okay? <laughs> Don't worry yeah. about it. I'm gonna keep letting you live. I, you know, there's no point trying to make you be something you're not. I'm trying that. It's not working very well. <laughs> yeah, you got an video. You also get, um, High oh, no. Lord Kolaris. Oh, is, Kolaris uh... and Kolaris as well, yeah. Yeah, Kolaris is a good example of a real hate sink type villain. Mm. Much more so than Kord, I think. Because unlike Kord, who is very petty and small scale, Kolaris does some really grand scale awful shit. But god damn, if he isn't uh, just absolutely disgusting in all the right ways. To be fair, I would I would put his son above him. Because again, the, the issue with Kolaris is we just get so little with him in the end. Mm. We get a, on we, yeah. we don't get a lot of him on screen. I will I would accept that we get a lot of him. <laughs> a lot of the shit he's doing, but we don't get a lot of him on screen. Because we get what? We get a couple of scenes in um Academy Book Fury. Two, three, and uh yeah. Book two, he shows up first and a few times. And book then, three, he shows up at the beginning and ends. He shows and up book four. The, book four he's 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 in bed with a broken spine because um, Bernard is a fucking <laughs> beast. <laughs> but fucking shots. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, no, Kolaris, his, his, Kolaris his Brentis Minoris yeah. is a lot more ever-present and a lot scummier. Yeah. He is a sleazeball to the point where him dying horribly is just absolutely great to see. I would argue that he is called done better. Mm, yeah. Because he's 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 similar in scope. He is he's a very small minded, petty person who only cares about say. himself and his problems. He is he is a fucking misogynistic slaver who has raped girls and you know mm -hmm. picks on uh picks on Aaron and uh Tavi for for being no good reason, in right? his for no good reason, but in his eyes for being weaker mm -hmm. and being lesser than him. And he um, still got fucking the shit kicked out of him by Tavi, anyways, which is great. Well, yeah, the point is that Tavi, Tavi or Aaron were not weak. They were just they just weren't showing themselves off because they were training to be curses, and you know, be pretty pretty fucking obvious that they're being trained as curses if suddenly they decided to beat the shit out of Brensis one day. Mm -hmm. Though to be fair, it's Tavi was able to beat up the two thugs. Who didn't really have a wide range of fury craft? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it would have gone as well for him against Brensis. Why not? Because for all his faults, Brensis is a strong fury crafter. Yeah, he still got killed with the single slash sprout. Yeah, because again, he's a dumb misogynistic slaver. <laughs> yep, and that backfires on him hard. Yep. Um, but the book series I was going to bring up was Cradle. Ooh, yeah, Cradle's a good one. Um, got a lot of fun villains. Wide variety of villains in there. Because obviously we've got the got the unstoppable forces of the Dread Gods. Mm -hmm. Who, again, you can't really characterize them as villains, to be fair. Because they mm -hmm. are just unstoppable forces. There's no... Well... Up until they are a, largely mindless beasts. Up until a certain point, there's no malice behind it. Mm -hmm. Well, with the soul, with one exception, but with one exception, but you know, once we get to what was it, Reaper? Yeah. Um, and the death of should say spoiler warning for anyone well, this is not Red Cradle. We haven't gone to this the these bits um in our podcast about it, but you know. Um But once Subject One dies and they gain more sentience, you know, Bleeding Phoenix suddenly goes Yeah, let's let's start tearing shit up purposefully now. Um mm -hmm. Wandering Titan. They all go in that direction. Yeah, to be fair. yeah. There's a lot more, lot more um, purpose 
behind their actions. Obviously, you've got the Silent King as well, who, uh, oh boy. Yeah, he... By all indications, he was always malicious. He is very malicious, yes. Um, but in terms of the human antagonists, Rhaegon Shen. Rhaegon Shen, to be fair, isn't human. Yes, I get what you mean. Did I say human antagonists? Yes. Fair enough. My bad. Uh, <laughs> no, Reagan Shen's a good one, though, yeah. because he is, like, very much an example of how to write a villain as very preening, very arrogant, very self-centered. Again, up until, up until the most recent book, confident. He's... Up until the most recent book, he is basically another unstoppable force. He gets to do this in front of our heroes because he knows he can't lose. Or he believes he can't lose. Mm -hmm. It is only when... Um, it is only at the end of Reaper when... Um, well, it is only because uh, you know Linden advances... And Reagan Shen has been in the fucking power sucking labyrinth for an entire year. That mm -hmm. uh, Linden is actually able to do anything to him. It is only um, in Dread God when uh, Linden has gone a big old Dread God steroid upgrade that he's uh, he's able to talk to Reagan Shen in a manner of I'm not letting you monologue anymore. You try that shit now, and I'm going to stomp you. Mm -hmm. It probably won't do it, do much to you, but it'll show that I can do it. <laughs> and you don't want to start a fight right now. You know you don't want to yep. start a fight right now. Um, Honestly, most of the villains in Cradle, uh, pre pre the pre uncrowned tournaments, uh are pretty much uniformly the arrogant uh, mm. arrogant kung fu guy types. Yeah. Who uh, was the it? sole exception of uh, Jai Long. To be fair... Are you going to say Jai Long is a villain rather than an antagonist? I think he is... No. I, I am saying like most of the main antagonists oh, prior okay. uh, to yeah. the Uncrunking tournament, barring Jai Long, Right, are arrogant kung fu yes. guy type anti uh, type villains. I mean, it's it's an interesting you know discussion to be had on whether Jai Long is a full villain um, or not. Um, he I would is say, at the very least an antagonist, but he is a more sympathetic one than most of the other villains. I would him, say the only time him. he really goes into villain territory is probably. Black Flame. Mm, yeah. And even then, he, it is tragic villainy. Yeah, he doesn't really have much of a choice, does he? He has a choice, but, you know, he... What is he... He's doing bad things, and he's doing it for the purpose of killing Linden, but, um... You know, he's only facing Linden because Linden killed his friend, even if, you know, that's not a good reason considering the friend was trying to kill Linden in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, he's doing it to get back at the Jai clan, who, to be fair, seem mostly assholes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so... And he's doing it to gain power to protect his sister. So it, there is that, you know, there is that tragic air to it. But I would still say his actions in Black Flame are villainous. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, it's, we obviously uh, we also have the um, what's his name, the Mad King. Mm -hmm. Um. So, um, God, what what are his two names again? Um, there's uh, there's Oskimoth the 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 fiend, and then Daruman, I believe. Yeah, Daruman. Yes. 
I wonder if Will White one day was trying to type Saruman, but accidentally typed D at the start instead, and then looked at it and went, that's a good name. I'm going to use that. Eh, maybe. Who knows? I don't. Um, but still, um, honestly, what makes most of the Cradle villains in the first half of the series a bit weaker than the later ones, in my opinion, anyways, is that they largely fall into the same character archetype. Mm. And it's only around the Uncrowned King tournament where they, uh, or, or the lead up to it that they start becoming a lot more differentiated from each other yeah and filling out different character archetypes mm. in contrasting ways both to each other and to the heroes yeah so we've just talked about a series with um a seemingly on omnipotent mentor let's talk about another one oh. jujutsu kaisen ah uh, yes sukuna and of course ghetto sukuna ghetto Fake Gato, uh, Mahito. Mm -hmm. Those are the big ones. Yep. And all are fantastic in their own way. So obviously, I mean, Sukuna is... Again, he's the unstoppable force. Yeah, but he is a different kind of... He is an unstoppable force with personality. Yeah. Again, he's he's got a charisma to him, and you know, certainly in the in the anime, that's helped by Junichi Sawabe, who is a fantastic actor. Um, yeah, he just has a lot of confidence and panache. Mm -hmm. I feel is the big thing with but him. Again, you know, he he, he is showmanship. He is another villain who, when he enters a room, he takes that shit over. Mm hmm. When he enters a room, everybody pays attention. Um, you know, um, Mahito is a different villain. He's the hate sink. He just does fucking awful shit. And that's why we want to see him um, get taken down. But he's got a charisma to him as well. He, If he didn't, he wouldn't have been able to uh, manipulate Junpei. And his, you know, mm -hmm. his discussions with Junpei are very interesting. Um, but he is very much, you know, the hate sink. Um, actual Gato is, you know, again, he's he's charismatic. You see that you see that in Zero when he arrives, everybody takes notice. He takes control of that room. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a room. He takes control of that pathway. <laughs> um, Fake Gato is the chess master, basically. Chess master type villains are really interesting mm. and can be done really well. Uh, but at the same time, you run the risk of uh, going overboard, like with Aizen from Bleach, who is just like. Everything went all according to plan. Even the things I couldn't have possibly planned for. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, on the other hand, you have uh, guys like Moriarty uh, from all the adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, who's always like the shadowy chess master working behind the scenes. Or you have uh, characters like Crocodile and Do Flamingo from One Piece. Mm. Or Basically, they're, they're chess master uh, uh, leaning magnificent bastards, in my opinion. Hmm. I mean, Crocodile, again, is he's, he's definitely a villain in his first appearances, but he mellows out a lot more as the series goes on. Well, he's still very, very clearly uh, villainously aligned, even in his more recent appearances. Because hmm. even when he's helping out uh, Luffy and uh, Luffy and such in uh, in the Summit War, he is still very much like, I'm doing this so I can kill Whitebeard, not because I want to help you. I mean, that's that's basically all he... That's, that's essentially what he said throughout the entirety of Impile Down as well. I'm only coming with you to get out myself. I'm not doing this because I want to work with you, Straw Hat. I'm just using you to get out. Don't get me wrong here. 
that is crocodile in a nutshell though he is a very much self-focused and uh self-promoting person but he is goddamn charismatic and very Mm -hmm. competent very which is why yeah yeah, which is why he is such a magnificent bastard Mm mm-hmm and you get a similar thing with Joe Flamingo, who is just like so much more vile than Crocodile, but mm. he is at the same time a very cunning planner whose plans are only derailed because of stuff he could not possibly have foreseen happening. Because a big fucking wrecking ball called Straw Hat Luffy, yeah, uh, smashed <laughs> smashed its way into um, what's his face, uh, Dress Rosa. Well, to be fair, he actually did account for Luffy. It's just Sabo showing up through a huge monkey wrench in his plan. Yeah, that also. <laughs> that damn fucking family. <laughs> <laughs> fucking no, wrecking is, shit wherever it, it goes. <laughs> with characters like Doflamingo, that villainous breakdown works so well because before their their, their meltdown, they are just seemingly untouchable, plan for everything, incredibly calculating and all that and then things go horribly horribly wrong for them Mm. and everything crumbles and it is magnificent um i mean other villains from one piece akainu akainu is a good one because he is such a contrast to most of the others yeah he's a knight templar Mm. with a dogmatic uh philosophy I mean, Knight Templars are really interesting villains. Mm-hmm. And, you know, can work really well as hate sinks. And I would I would argue that Akainu is in that role. Um, mm-hmm. you know. At least when we meet him. He's a bit more nuanced nowadays, what with, with all the Gorosei bullshit. <laughs> Dealing with just bu- the bullshit of running the Navy and and just that... God damn it, that, that fucking Buddha asshole set me up, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Big Mom's another example of a really good villain in One Piece. Mm. Because a lot like Doflamingo, he is characterized as this seemingly invincible villain in a very different way just because of how physically untouchable she is. And the fact that her, her seems- devil fruit is fucking scary. Her Delford is fucking busted and terrifying as all hell. She herself is one of the most terrifying villains in the series. I mean, that that fucking scene where... Um, what was it? I think it's just... No, it's in the run-up to that big cliffhanger at the end of chapter whatever it was. Yeah. Um, that is, you know... The Straw Hats trying to get away and then seemingly being, uh, obliterated. Seemingly being obliterated while Big Mom is... It's while Big Mom is just eating the cake, isn't it? Yeah, that's chapter 900. Yeah, that's still one of the creepiest fucking things I've seen, especially in the anime. The anime did a, did, did, did that really well. Oh they, yeah, they no. turn All that the creep factor. Lovers are horrifying. They turn that creep factor up to a hundred, and it worked perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got Kaido. Yeah, Kaido is the invincible wall that yeah. needs to be toppled in order to advance. And again, it feels it feels earned the way that Luffy does it. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there was. Uh, big, big, big spoiler warnings for One Piece. If you're not current on the uh, on the manga, mute now for the next five minutes. I would say maybe. Um, maybe. I mean, you can you can judge yourself how long you think we're going to talk about this. But seriously, if you do not want to be spoiled for a big, big thing, mute now. One, two, mm-hmm. three. Four, five. Obviously, um, you know, Luffy pulled Gear Five out of the bag, which you know mm-hmm. did sort of come out of nowhere to an extent. Um, but you know, that was only because of CP Zero's interference. 
Leafy was doing a pretty fucking good job against Kaido before that, and that was because he trained well, and, you know, that power-up felt earned. Yep. Um, obviously, as I said, Gear 5, the fucking sun god shit, did sort of... Was it foreshadowed? They, a lot less than it probably should have been, but yeah. it was still foreshadowed. I mean, we're unfortunately still in this it's still in this phase of it's new enough that people haven't gone back and read and read with that knowledge and gone, oh my god, look at all this foreshadowing I would have put in there. Mm -hmm. Most of the bigger foreshadowing comes from a lot more recently. Yeah. Than uh, other examples. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, the way, again, the way that Luffy ended up beating Kaido felt earned. Um, what other things do we, I've mean, been talking about, mostly been talking about good ones. Is there any bad ones we really want to shout out or, you know, drag through the mud? I mean, you mentioned Voldemort and it talked a little bit about why he's absolutely awful as a villain. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want to elaborate, please feel free. Well, again, the point is, is that, you know, he's such a background force for so many of the books. Um, you know, book one, um, he doesn't. It doesn't become apparent that he is the villain until really the villain until basically the second to last chapter. I think it is. Mm. Um, book two again. It doesn't become clear until the climax that it is Voldemort who's doing this shit. Book three, he's not even in. Book four. He's in the background, but it's not really him that's messing with Harry. It's it's fake Moody. It's Crouch. Uh -huh. um, book five again. Umbridge takes the antagonist role. Book six is where he should be should really be showing up. But the point is is that by trapping Harry in Hogwarts, it makes it impossible to really have Voldemort hanging around. And even with Harry outside of Hogwarts in Book 7, Voldemort isn't really prominent until the back half of the book. Again, because he's been set up as this unstoppable force, and Harry isn't ready. And, you know, he doesn't become ready throughout, throughout the book, so it becomes this, you know, deus ex machina shit to allow him to win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and there there are many, many, many ways to interpret that stupid fucking shitty prophecy, but that was not one of them, and so that victory felt unearned. Mm. He's a good hate sink when he's on the screen because he does, you know, he does bad shit. He killed Harry's parents. He kills a lot of people. He tortures a lot of people. Um, but it's also sort of hindered by the fact that the books got their start as children's fiction, and therefore the Death Eaters, as you know, uh, the minions of Voldemort, aren't allowed to go to truly scandalous depth. You know, they get, they do some killing, they do some torturing, but overall, they are just sort of, yeah, they're just, they're just killers and torturers. And that just, that just seems, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that, you know, I wanted them to do more and worse, but it just kind of feels mundane. Mm-hmm. Okay, speaking of bad villains... You remember the Hobbit movie trilogy, right? Yes. Remember that one uh, orc dude that was uh, consistent oh, uh, that threat dude. throughout the movies? Yeah. Yeah. 
the problem was he was so underwritten and generic and yeah. he, yet he persisted throughout the whole goddamn move the whole goddamn series up until the end yeah and it did not feel earned I mean, Lord of the Rings did that. It did that with with Lurtz in the first one. And it did that with Gothmog in the final one. Of, you know, pointing out this particular orc or Uruk who is in control uh, and is the leader of the forces against the heroes. Yes, but none of them overstate their welcome by that staying around is for the three point. straight movies. That is the point. Lurtz was taken out once he came up against Aragorn, and that worked because it it was a feel good moment at a point in the film that needed it. Uh-huh. We needed that, you know. We needed Aragorn to get that win. Otherwise, otherwise there wouldn't have been a win for the Fellowship. Yeah. Merry and Pippin had been taken. Frodo and Sam are on their own. Boromir is fucking dying. Without Aragorn getting that kill, there is no win. Um, mm-hmm. Gothamog, again, he's more... It's more to show that there is somebody in control of Sauron's forces outside of Gondor than he is actually somebody to hunt down and kill. I mean, we see his death in the movies. It's a deleted scene, I believe. I think it's in the extended edition. Yeah, he gets overwhelmed by the ghost army, right? No, you just basically what happens is it's it's after um it's after Eowyn has uh taken down the Witch King. And obviously she's injured. Gothmog starts limping towards her. Eowyn tries to reach for a sword, can't manage it. And then fucking Gimli and Aragorn just show up, murk him and keep moving. <laughs> That's great. They absolutely just like fucking like, I think Aragorn just cuts off his arm, Gimli gets him in the gut, and then uh, Aragorn cuts off his head or something like that. And they just keep moving. They don't know they've just killed the enemy general. <laughs> they just fucking murked a random orc to them. They don't even know they saved Eowyn. <laughs> they... uh, that's great. So, yeah, it's, it's funny in that sense, but, you know, it probably works better to say, oh, he, he just got overwhelmed by... Uh... By the thing he feared, whatever. Um, but yeah, he doesn't overstay his welcome. He doesn't show up again at the end of the film. There's also, of course, uh, if we're keeping up with bad movie vil- uh, bad villains in general, Malekith from uh, Thor: The Dark World is probably the weakest of the Marvel villains. Like phases one and two of Mar- of the MCU are pretty uh, weak villain wise, except for uh, Loki mm. and, to a lesser extent, Red Skull. But Malekith is probably the worst one just because of how underwritten he is. Loki Loki and uh Red Skull succeed in part because of the, the ability of their actors. And I'm not saying that Christopher Eccleston is a bad actor. In no way am I saying that. He just they Red Skull and Loki at least got something to do and so their actors had something to work with. Malekith got nothing. Malekith got Utterly shafted by the writing and directing of the movie. How how much of the movie does he actually appear in? Do you think about ten minutes at most? At most, I'll I'll push it to fifteen because of the climax. But even then, like that's a fight. There's nothing really for him to do in that. Nothing really. F- at that point, the characterization needs to have been done. <laughs> you can't be doing yeah. characterization in the final fight. <laughs> Correct. You know, Loki, Loki, Loki succeeds because, you know, um, his character, again, is the charismatic trickster type, um, which is entertaining. And, you know, Tom, Tom Hiddleston knocks it out of the fucking park. Um, Red Skull succeeds because, let's be real, A, he's a Nazi. Real easy to make them villains. Mm-hmm. Tough, tougher to go the other way, but... I'll be damned if Iraqi didn't fucking try it. <laughs> Not gonna say he succeeded, but he fucking tried his best. <laughs> yep. Um, but you know the other the other part is that um, God, I always forget his name. The actor. Uh, what's Peter Weaving? 
Hugo Weaving. That's it. I always forget his name. I always forget his name. I always remember that he played Agent Smith, Elrond, and fucking Red Skull, but I never remember his name. Hugo Weaving is just, again, he has such a presence to him as well. Mm -hmm. Such a presence to him. And the other thing is that we get a lot of scenes with Red Skull. We get a lot of seeing his reaction to what um, to what Cap is doing. Um, so yeah, the, those are the good villains on that side. Yeah, there's not a lot of good MCU villains, certainly in phase, phases one and two. Um, I'm trying to think. I have to actually have to look at the list of movies to remind myself of some of these villains. Um, uh, Iron Man one that has uh, Iron Monger, who is uh, fun if only for that one meme about uh, Tony Stark and boxes of scrap. <laughs> Tony Stark built this armor uh, in a cave with a box of scraps. Yeah, uh, Iron Man two. We've talked about Iron Man two. Not good. Thor, mm -hmm. Loki, Captain America one, um, Red Skull, Avengers, Loki, Iron Man three. We've talked about Killian. Thor the Dark World, we'll talk about Malekith. Captain America the Winter Soldier. Uh, the Winter Soldier himself, Bucky Barnes. Again, a borderline case, really. Again, more set up as the Unstoppable Force. He didn't get really any characterization beyond what we already had for him from the first Captain America. It was more mm -hmm. about his the, that, the effect that had on, uh, on Cap. Um... Yep. Guardians of the Galaxy, Ronin. Ronin is a lot more generic, but largely because they are building an ensemble film and focusing more on. Yeah, uh, they had they had a lot to do to make sure that the you know the characters got together, and then they were willing to work together. Mm -hmm. So that left little room for uh, villain um, uh, villain development. Um, Avengers: Age of Ultron. I don't think Ultron was bad, um, but he was very much a Joss Whedon villain, which are yeah. very, very quippy. He leaned way too hard into the quips. I think, uh, who was it, James Spader? James Spader, yep. James Spader did a good job as Ultron. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the quips sort of took the, uh, the menace out of it. Um, Ant-Man... Yellow jacket. That one generic ball of the evil dude. Yeah. Not much generic Marvel villain. Yeah. At least Malekith had a neat design. Um, Civil War. Zemo. Mm-hmm. Again, Z Zemo, Zemo is more the chess master type, and he, to be fair, he had them dancing to his tune most of the movie. But mm -hmm. because because it was a movie and not a series, that meant Zemo didn't really get that much um, characterization until uh, fucking um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Doctor Strange, yeah. uh, Paul Mads Mikkelsen. A waste of a perfectly good Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Ego was pretty Ego good. Ego was a good fire. one. Ego was pretty good. He's how you write a monstrous villain with nuance and uh, mm -hmm. layers to his psychopathy. And this is this is an occasion where the cheeriness worked in his favor. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, you, because you, you got make the him, sense you make him seem jovial and yeah. uh, affable and such, and uh, and that and that it made the... highlight his monstrosity. Yes, and that that provided a really good contrast to his his pers personality was a really good contrast to his actions. Yes. Um, Spider Man Homecoming. Yeah, uh, oh, Vulture as well. Vulture, Vulture is good. Vulture is good again. Large part due to the performance. Um, Michael Keaton, wasn't it? Michael Keaton. Very, very commanding presence. Especially especially compared to um Tom Holland. Mm -hmm. I'm not they I'm not saying that Tom Holland isn't commanding, but obviously Peter Parker is, you know, at this point a high school teen. 
which works really well against as a contrast against Vulture. Is this older, older, more commanding dude? Uh, Ragnarok has Hella, who is Hella commanding, and uh, also Kate Blanchett, who just chewing the fucking scenery. Absolutely, Absol absolutely having so much fun with the role. Again, having that kind of villain worked in Thor Ragnarok because it was that kind of movie. It was a cheesier movie. Mm -hmm. um, but she provides just the right amount of mood wet flash whenever she shows up. Yes, out. yes. Uh, Black Panther. Uh, Killmonger is probably the best part of the movie. Yep. Um, and then we get to th get to Thanos in Infinity War. I may have criticized his writing a bit earlier, but god damn is he well well portrayed. Especially by Josh Brolin's acting. Again, gr Josh Brolin's acting, damn. Josh Brolin's vocal performance. A lot of this isn't even really in isn't even in the um the physical acting. It's in it's yeah. in the vocal performance, and that is why that is why yeah. voice acting is tr is true acting. You cannot say it's not because you know if you don't get that cadence right as a villain, if you don't get your cadence right as a villain, you're just not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And that is that is what uh, that is what um, was done so well with Thanos. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, in Endgame. That um, that line when Thor, uh, Cap, and Iron Man are approaching him, it's like, and where did that bring you? Back to me. And it mm -hmm. just—I can't remember the full quote. That's all I remember off the top of my head. But you know that you can't, you could not live with your failure. And yeah. where did that bring you? Back, Back to, to me. me. Yeah. Again, the delivery of that is what sells it. That line could have felt so fucking dumb if it if it hadn't been delivered properly, but it was. Mm -hmm. Um. So before we end, because we are we are rapidly approaching the two hour. I do want to bring up what you mentioned Nazis being good villains earlier. I want to bring up Colonel Hans Landa from Glorious Bastards. Go for because it. Because God damn, is he a very well acted uh, villain? It, Okay, and then he, I, I have two what, points. Then I I have two points to mention, but I'll you you go ahead. You go ahead. Part of what makes him so good is the performance, because apparently Quentin Tarantino did not want to write him in unless he could get the perfect actor for the part. Hmm. And Christoph Waltz was just so fucking perfect for the role because he knew all the languages he needed, and he is. God tier acting wise. No, Cr Christoph Waltz is incredible. He is so good, and he brings the sense of affability mm. and monstrousness simultaneously to the part. Yeah, that just makes it so engaging. Mm -hmm. Like you can't tell if he's going to pat someone on the back or shoot them in the foot. Yeah, and you know it could go either way based off of just how god damn intimidating the man is mm -hmm. so sticking on the quentin tarantino train look he has his problems we are not going to deny that but he is a fucking good filmmaker when he wants to be um mm -hmm. django unchained because i watched it uh, a few days ago oh leo dicaprio does a fantastic fucking job as calvin as candy and uh and sam uh, jackson, sam jackson as steven well. yeah Obviously, you know, um, Steven, the character, will, you know, will probably hit harder for uh, people of color um, in that sort of race trade away, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even me as a, you know, white guy can tell that, you know, Sam Jackson did a really fucking good job with it. Um, you know, especially working in, you know, it's clear that he is manipulating the Candy family. Because mm -hmm. he is he is the one that notices um, Django and um, Christoph Waltz's character's um, plan. 
um, and you get it more explicitly um, near the end when um, he points out that he is the one who got Django sent to the mining company because he kept pointing, he kept having to point it out to the to the new head of the family sort of thing. So he does that's that's really well done. Calvin Candy again, Leonardo DiCaprio, kind of problematic person, sort of. Um, mm-hmm. Damn good actor. He is a fantastic actor. Damn Whatever good actor. Else you will say about the man. And again, you know, it's that scene once he's once he's been told about this plan. He takes over that room. Yeah. He apparently cut his fucking hand open while yeah. he, when he broke the glass in that scene, and he yeah. kept on going. Again, you know. It's goddamn impressive. Yeah, but, you know, he takes over, his, uh, takes over that room with his anger, and it just works as a scene. It, it is the most intense scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. Is all because of his presence. Um, the other one I wanted to mention, we mentioned it earlier, Dragon Ball. Yes. Now, what Dragon Ball does, and it is a consequence of of the writing of Toriyama's writing style and the genre that he writes in, a lot of the Dragon Ball villains are the same archetype: the unstoppable force that the hero has to train to overcome. Mm-hmm. And that is where Dragon Ball falls into its issue. Because that worked the first time. Worked the second time. Worked the third, fourth, and fifth time. Sixth time, getting a little old. Seventh time, kind of needed more characterization. Eighth time, Jiren didn't work at all. Mm. And now that's not just because of the archetype that they are. Because obviously, you know, the ones where it did work, the King Piccolos, the Freezers, the Cells, they had personality behind them as well. Yeah, even with Boo, who is probably the weakest of the original manga vil- main villains, mm. he, Boo at least had personality. He had an interesting it, personality because it contrasted so... Certainly at the, at the start, it contrasted so well with the previous villains. Because mm-hmm. he, because he and wasn't then he this became generic evil monster. Dude. Yes, he did. But you know, the original margin Fat Boo was in was a really interesting contrast because he's not this evil dude. He's basically this childlike guy who's got more power than he knows what to do with. Yep. Um. So you know, but yeah, you know, Frieza. Had some really had a has a really strong personality, and it works. That's why, you know, that's why he gets brought back so often. Yep. Um, because he's got this. I'm not. It's not even really an affable facade, so to speak. But you know, this casual arrogance that he is the strongest, and that nothing these idiots can do can hurt him and it just works so well i mean i've been watching um been watching tfs's um first xenoverse playthrough with dumpling um and i've just recently watched the episode with the with the lead up to freezer and again you know he has he has that control in the dialogue because he knows, as much as Vegeta is saying, I am the one you fear, I am the Super Saiyan, Vegeta's no fucking Super Saiyan. Nope. Vegeta's gonna get stomped down into the dirt like the rest of them. You know, it's even it's even more enhanced in the abridged version as well. Yep. I mean, you know, there's a lot to praise about TFS's writing. They did the villain so fucking well. They really did. Like every every villain had their little quirk, but they also had, you know, a relative air of menace to them. Mm-hmm. Apart from Kui, Kui, Kui didn't have menace in the original. <laughs> yeah. Even Goldo gets some menace. <laughs> yep. 
Now, I do want to, before we wrap up, I do want to bring up some examples from other mediums because we didn't really talk about um, We didn't talk Western about video games, did or, we? Or Western no, we animation. didn't bring up video games at all. We only briefly bring, brought up the Disney movie villains, but yeah. even then, uh, Disney movie villains have been pretty fantastic across the board, though, mm. uh, in uh, a lot of the Renaissance properties and a lot of the early stuff. Because, like, you have Maleficent, who has a hell of a lot of presence. Mm. You have the Evil Queen, of course. You have Jafar. You have Ursula. You have Scar. You have Gaston. And all those. Like, each and every one of them has their own... uh, Has a very strong personality and presence that gels incredibly well with the film that they're in. Which mm. is something a lot of the weaker Disney movies don't have. A lot of weaker anime movies in general don't, don't have. But we also do ha- uh, but there are also villains in uh, Western television uh, in Western anime and television like say Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls is uh, one of the best Bill. ones I can think of. Yeah. Who is just this perfect blend of charm and terror. Terror. He's, an, he's another. He's another. Like, he's another one that does that whiplash so well. Because he seems like this affable guy, and then he tears some teeth out of a deer's head as a present, and you go, "Oh, this guy fucked up." Yeah, he really fucked in the head. You know, you and you get those moments where he gets truly angry. And you suddenly realize this is not a guy to fuck with. Uh huh. This this guy's scary. If we try and fight him head on, we are going to die. Uh huh. Um, other Western animation, uh, Bellos in Owl House. I was gonna bring him up too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really, really good villain. Um going to be interesting to see where what happens to him in the first of the season three episodes uh this october both the garden wall's a good one uh who's that you cut out a little bit oh over the garden wall has a very good villain uh it does a lot really well with uh just having a villain just slowly creep out of the background into Mm. prominence over the course of the series i need to watch that I won't go into detail about it then, mm. but the beast is absolutely fucking terrifying. Yeah. Oh, uh, who else? Oh, fuck. How did I not mention uh, She-Ra? Uh, the She-Ra reboot has some fantastic villains throughout. Uh, especially um, Katra and uh, Hordak are just incredibly well written and have mm. just straight up See series-long character arcs that take them into interesting places. Which is not something you see from a lot of uh, stuff aimed at younger mm. audiences. Yeah. Um, so, video games. Um, so I missed the chance to get a nice transition from talking about Disney movie villains to... Uh, you know, video games through Kingdom Hearts, but, um... God damn it. Yeah, that's, that's what, I thought that's where you were going, but, uh, ah, oh, well, alas. Kingdom Hearts, no. I, I am not down that rabbit hole. Thank no, God. unfortunately, I don't think either of us are down that rabbit hole enough to really say, um, anything about Kingdom Hearts. I've played part of the first game, but it sort of drove me mad, because it's from, like, 2000, what, 4, 5? <laughs> Probably like that. Probably early. I I can't remember. Um. Anyway, um. Obviously, my favorite series, Dragon Age, or one of my favorite series. Um. Dragon Age has some good villains. Good. I feel like Dragon Age Origins does a really good job of having two contrasting main antagonists. Yes. The, hu- of, uh... the human antagonist and the you know, the unstoppable force of the blight. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you've got Loghain oh Loghain yep. and uh, how the archdemon yeah oh 
Yeah, our how is fucking Tim Curry just doing a fucking great job as usual. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, Logan works in the same vein that the that the villains in you know, um, Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire work in that he thinks he's being clever, but he's missing the true true threat. Mm-hmm. Um, which is obviously the Archdemon, who is set up really nicely as, you know, that and the Blight is set up really nicely as this, you know, overwhelming threat. Um, through, you know, the death of, you know, half the army, and especially Duncan at the start of the game. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, you know, I... This isn't talked about enough. It's a really nice touch that after a, after you've done a couple of the main quests, Lothering is just gone. You can't go back there anymore. Like, that really emphasizes that you're on a time limit and the blight is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um... Dragon Age 2, um... Dragon Age 2 doesn't have a central villain for most of that. It, not it really. Rotates. Uh, I mean... Because you have... You don't really have a central villain for the first, uh, act. Act 2, it's the Arshok, I believe. Yeah. And Act 3, it's Meredith. And maybe Orsino, depending on if you I decide mean... with the Templars or not. The Arashok. Arashok is interesting because on the one hand he seems generic at first, but on the other hand he does play the role of the honorable villain to an extent. That's what I mean. I'm not sure if I would really call him a villain. He's of a different culture. And, you know... He's a a villain by circumstance. A lot of what he says is kind of right. The city is a cesspool of corruption and greed and treachery. Mm-hmm. So I... You could see the Arashok as a villain. I would see him more as an antagonist. Completely fair. Um, and then we get... Um, is it Meredith? Meredith is absolutely a villain. Meredith is a hundred percent the villain. I would say, I would say, rather than a character being a villain um, in Dragon Age Two, it's the it's an it's it's the it's the honor. It's the abstract concept. Yeah. It's the it's the concept of corrupting power. Uh huh. Because you you know you see it in Act One, the villain is set up to be to basically be Bertrand. He, betra- mm-hmm. he betrays you because of the corrupting influence of um, of the idol. Same happens to Meredith, and that's that's why I would say that the Arashok doesn't really apply because he doesn't have that he doesn't have that fall to to corruption in that sense. Mm. Um, he has power already, and he doesn't use it. Uh, to corrupt means, yeah. Yeah. And he isn't corrupted by it either. Um, again, you know, he is he is of a different culture, one that you know. I don't necessarily agree with. You know, Kunari culture is is weird and probably not great, but you know. It is very different from anything we do yeah, culture. Yeah, very different. Um, and then Dragon Age, Dragon Age Inquisition. Corypheus is kind of weak. Yeah, Corypheus is just kind of. What doesn't help with Corypheus is that he's not really focused upon all that much. Yeah, for most of the narrative. The issue, the issue with Inquisition is. It's so much less of a personal story than, or personal battle, than Origins or Two was. Origins, you were the only Grey Wardens 
in the country. You had to be the one fighting because there would be nobody else. Mm -hmm. Even once you even once you gather the army, you're the only ones that can kill the archdemon without it surviving. Dragon Age yeah. Two. You're a fucking you're a fucking dumbass who just happened to find his way to Kirkwall and is dropped in some serious shit time after time after time. You don't have any support other than your friends. Dragon Age Jeez. Three, you're the leader of the Inquisition. The grand narrative. You're yeah. the leader of the Inquisition, which is fighting against the forces of Corythius. You are the general. You don't get to actually do a lot of personal battles in the in the same sense that um, you do in two or origins. And by the time yeah. you do face off against Corypheus, there's no, there's not as much of a sense of satisfaction as you get when you land that final blow on the Archdemon. Or, you know, you've earned the Arashok's respect even as you kill him. You know, you... There's not that sort of bombastic sense because the war is all but over. All that's left is to kill Corythius. And that that lends a somewhat sense of an anticlimax. Now there is a villain that we can talk about in terms of Inquisition that didn't really happen until Trespasser. Oh yes. The that... Dread Wolf himself. Spoiler warning for Dragon Age. Five, four, three, four. two, four. one. Yeah. Solus. Good old Solus. Eggman himself. That's cut. Fuck, we didn't talk about Eggman or Bowser. <laughs> Damn it. Anyways, uh, yeah. The no, issue, the issue is... is this is such a broad topic, my dude. <laughs> You're not wrong. We could talk for another two hours and not not reach uh, not reach all the villains we wanted to talk about, or we could have talked about. Yeah. But yeah, Solus is interesting because he is a very different kind of villain mm. from what was previous in these games. He is the archetype of the friend slash mentor who goes over to the the dark side. Except he was always on the dark side. He just in this case, he was always on the dark side, but mm. he had the potential to be, you know, good. And he mm. was at least trying or pretending to be good yeah. when he was with you. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, we've only got that one DLC um, so far with him as acting the villain. So we'll have to mm -hmm. have to wait until four to really pin him down. Mm -hmm. But that scene at the end of Trespasser is, I is I still think, it's the best part of Inquisition overall. Like, and obviously that's not as high a bar as it could be, but I also think it's it is one of the better scenes in this franchise as a whole. Because mm -hmm. so it is just so. You know, you fought your way to the end, and you, then you see Solus, and you're curious. Well, the player isn't, because, you know, we know he's the Dread Wolf. Um, and we've obviously heard stories about the Dread Wolf. But, you know, the character is confused. Solus, why are you here? Oh. And the realization <laughs> hits, the penny drops, and... Solus takes your arm. Solus. Whoops. To be fair, he does it to save you. But, you know... Yes, yes. But the point remains is that he is planning to change the world, and probably not for the better for you. Mm-hmm. Probably not for the better for anyone who isn't an elf. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he's he's a fascinating character because because that that's the mm -hmm. thing you do get to know him, you or you can get to know him and his and his uh ideology so well through the course of Inquisition. Mm-hmm. Video games do have a lot of advantage where most of the mediums don't, besides, you know, novels and TV series, and that they get a lot more time to work with to develop buildings. I mean, I... If they use it properly. I'm not going to go into detail, um, 
because Jack, I know you're playing P5, but um, the villain in um, the Royale added part, the, fi the, the final, final boss, really good. And um, uh, the trader, Akechi, also really good. Mm -hmm. And again, it's because they're well written, they're well characterized. Um, I still feel bad for Akechi sometimes. I really mm. murked him in his fight. <laughs> yeah, speaking of Persona 5's villains. They do vary quite a bit in, in quality. Mm. As from the ones I've played against so far, Kamashita is a fantastic hate sink villain. He's a very good hate sink villain, yeah. Um, Kanashiro on the other end of the spectrum is very is a lot less personal and a lot less. Yeah, um... kind of. The issue with Kanashiro is he's meant to be basically the bridge between. The smaller personal villains, the Kamashida and the Madarame, who, you know, are personally enacting wrong against you and your friends. Mm -hmm. So the greater scope villains. E. Obviously, Kanashiro is blackmailing uh, Makoto. Yep. But, you know, his villainy is more wide scale. Yeah, he's really not the same. Uh... Kamish Kamishida's villainy was limited to the school. Yes, it was very, very bad, but it was limited to just the school. Madarame, um, a bit wider spread, but again, it's it's more personal villainy than it is societal villainy, the way it is for Kanashiro. Yeah. Have you reached... Um, what point have you reached in Royal? I am. I still just finished Kanashiro. I okay. haven't gone to the third dungeon yet. I I won't uh, say the fourth uh, fourth uh, fourth palace yet. I won't say anything about the um the other villains. Though I will say, um, you've met Shido at this point, right? Yeah, Shido's a prick. I don't think I'm gonna be you know spoiling anything to say he's one of the bosses. Oh, I am shocked. Shocked. I yeah. Say. Um. <laughs> And again, he is very much on the societal end of the villainy scale. He is a corrupt politician. Speaking of larger scale villains, Mass Effect, at least the first one, has mm. uh, quite the... Uh, has an eldritch horror type villain as the main antagonist. I promise Jack will get to Mass is... Effect 2 eventually. I know. <laughs> but Sovereign is just such a fan... Uh, such an interesting contrast with uh, mm. Saren, you know? Yeah. And that Saren thinks he's running the show. He thinks he's got all these cool plans figured out. And no, he is a puppet for a an eldritch monstrosity from beyond, well beyond his comprehension. So Saren is basically the soul to the to the to Sovereign's Vault Queen. Basically, yeah. We didn't talk about Saul. Eh, fuck him. <laughs> That's all he deserves. <laughs> but yeah. We've talked quite a bit about uh, villains overall, though. Yeah. But I th in the end, what makes a good villain and what makes a bad villain really comes down to three factors. Presentation, uh, uh, thematic uh, relevance and comparison and contrast to the uh, to the heroes i would add a fourth i, I would ones. i would add a fourth of performance performance yeah i i th that falls into presentation though oh okay i'll give you that opinion. i will give you that okay yeah i'll give you that yeah so it's presentation thematic relevance and contrast with yeah. uh, their heroic counterparts mm -hmm. i feel are three most important things to consider for making a good villain. Yeah. As if a villain is basically just absolutely completely irrelevant to the themes of the story and has no real contrast with the hero, then it doesn't really work for the story. Or if they contrast poorly with the hero, then it doesn't make for a good story. 
Mm. And if they're portrayed really awkwardly, then it doesn't work uh, work for the story. So there you have it. That's certainly our opinion um, on what makes a good villain. Um, obviously, you know, people will differ. Um, but thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, this has been a fun time to get to talk about villains. Uh, always a fun day when I get to uh, shit on aspects of Harry Potter. <laughs> fuck J.K. Rowling. She's a hack. And also a bigot, but that is neither here nor there. No, it's it's here. She's a bigot. Fuck her. Fair enough. She can go die in a hole. I don't care. Um... So yeah, thank you everybody for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed. In terms of future stuff, tomorrow we should be returning to D&D. Um, mm -hmm. Should be entering the Centrales Underground. That's going to be fun. Uh, we'll say, I said it on Twitter. Um, and I'll say it here again. Uh, at some point in the coming weeks, we are going to be playing in a one-shot for um, the system Blades in the Dark. Yep, that'll be fun. Um Gen will be running that one, so Kaido will get to be a player. So that's going to be fun. Because um, it is... It's going to be kind of contrasting players um, between uh, the two of us and Kaido and Dylan. So it's, uh -huh. it it's going to be interesting in that sense. Um, but that will be coming probably... Probably somewhere close to the end of October, I would say. Mm -hmm. Somewhere around there. We're not gonna we're not gonna say hallo it's the Halloween one shot, um, but it's you know it's taking the place of of the Halloween session because because Kaido doesn't really wanna or hasn't doesn't really uh, feel up to preparing for one of those, um, especially. And it wouldn't really fit into yeah. the current uh, flow. Of the paint, well, he's he's got one planned. But um, he doesn't really want to do it now because, um, yeah, it it wouldn't fit into where we are. Um, so we won't be doing a Halloween session. We'll be doing Blades in the Dark instead. But we prob we might do it on Halloween. We'll see. It all depends on you know, all depends on Gen basically and when uh, he's ready to do it. Um, Tuesday back to Persona Four Golden. You're going to be entering the Hall of Forest and I'm going to fucking die. Oh. Thursday, Ace Attorney, as always. It's going to be... A f it's always fun with Ace Attorney. Um, yep. Also, um, we haven't actually been doing Ace... Well, we've sort of technically been doing Ace Attorney for a year, so uh, we checked after the stream. So the first one did go up about a year ago. Um, but what I forgot is the fact that we did that after, um, after about 55 minutes of, um, Civ 6. And then we had to finish, um, Psychonauts 2, which took another few weeks. So we've actually, we've been playing Ace Attorney pretty continuously for nine months. Um... So as much as as much as we have been enjoying the games and trust trust us we have, we are getting ready for a break from Ace Attorney playing something else. We'll have to figure out what that is. So and if you want to find out, obviously, follow us here on Twitch. You'll get notifications for when we go live. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, generally, I just post the go live go live stuff, but I'll also post um. You know, info when we're not streaming, and um, if we do a tier list, I'll post a tier list when the final uh, archive goes up. For example, uh, today, the final archive for our Song of Ice and Fire tier list went up, um, as did the full tier list. So if you go to the Twitter, at storytime underscore net, that's where you'll find it. And then next Saturday, um, we haven't fully decided... Uh, what we are doing next Saturday yet. As a placeholder, we are thinking... Um, I'm on the wrong fucking thing. That's why I couldn't scroll up. Um, we are currently thinking Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. 
and maybe uh, some other anime movies if Jujutsu Kaisen Zero doesn't take the full uh, full two hours. But we are also investigating uh, a couple of other things. We just need to see basically who's available. Because um, obviously, you know, we do this. This isn't our jobs. So we're not getting paid for this. So, you know, jobs take precedence. Jobs take precedence. So again, thank you everybody for watching. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow for more D&D. Good night.